Welcome to the forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We're going to be talking today about sports and health. Um, it's inspired, our discussion today is inspired from a poll that was recently released by uh, the Chan School of Public Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and NPR. My name's Joe Neal. I'm a deputy science editor at NPR. I'll be today's moderator. Uh, our program today is about an hour long. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of different issues raised by this poll, uh, very fascinating and surprising results. Uh, let's get right to it. I want to introduce our panelists on my immediate, on my immediate right are Robert Blinden. Uh, Bob is professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, next to him is Elizabeth Matskin. Uh, she's Chief of Women's Sports Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. Uh, next to her is Ed Foster Simeon, President of the U.S. Soccer Foundation. Uh, the foundation works towards sports for social change, and it's the past recipient of the Steve Patterson Award for Excellence in Sports Philanthropy from the Ro Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I might add, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Sports Award will be announced uh, on September 10th in Princeton. Uh, joining us remotely are two Olympic athletes who we're very pleased to have with us today. They're also involved in raising awareness about sports participation in health. Uh, Caitlin Cahow is a former member of the U.S. Women's National Ice Hockey Team and currently a member of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And then we have Kobe Jones, three-time U.S. World Cup soccer player and ambassador for the U.S. Soccer Foundation. Um, our panel comes at a very propitious time after the U.S. Women's World Cup championship that just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I want to turn first to Bob, who can go over the highlights of the poll. Share with us what, uh, what we found. Uh, first of all, the purpose of this was to give Americans a chance in their own voices, essentially, to talk to us about their involvement in sports and health. And so what's unique about the poll is a couple of things. One is you were asked if you played a sport and then wh which one was the one you played most. And then you separated out if you were involved in exercise. What's very important about the finding is many surveys you talk about today talk about walking, America's leading sport. Turns out that's not true. Walking is America's leading form of exercise. Uh, so uh, likewise, we not only ask about you as an adult, we ask what you did as children. We asked if you're a parent, uh, what your kids now do. And that's gonna be some of the more dramatic findings. About children, something that's very important is many of the surveys only ask uh, people about their children's role in schools. We ask about their involvement in sports everywhere, and it turns out kids are involved in a lot of other community organizations. So I want to summarize a, a, a few high points, and it's going to open up the discussion, but the problem of reporting this is I have two different Americas to talk about. So I have an America of parents. So we talk uh, uh, three quarters of parents say their kids play a sport actively. And just so we're on record here, it's low income kids who are less likely uh, to be involved. There's often a picture that they're more involved, but they're actually not. But of those parents, they are unbelievably, and I'll show you in a moment, enthusiastic for what sports does for the kids, not only today, but it builds character, strength, cooperative skills, everything that's there. Uh, uh, for that. Not only that, uh, we have to control it. One in four of the parents we interviewed 
think and hope their kids grow up to play professional sports. Uh, I'll leave that to my colleagues to discuss the likelihood of that happening uh, uh, for that. Uh, so, okay, that, that should be the good news and quit. What's the other news is that we found that three quarters of adults don't play any sport at all. Uh, they may think it's a great thing for kids to do it or else, they, they don't at all. And each year after age 26, and my colleagues can describe what happens at 26.2 months, uh, whatever it is, I don't know, uh, but it falls off. And then the gender gap grows enormously. Each uh, decade as you get older, uh, women are much less likely to play a sport uh, uh, than, than men. And then low income in every single age category are just le less likely uh, to uh, participate. So you have this in incredible gap. You're talking to people who say to you, for my kid, everything in the world comes out of sports. Skills, health, everything else. How about you? Mm. Uh, for that. So let me just show you the data quickly and then we'll uh, uh, go to this if we can have just the first. Uh, so uh, here are parents' answers. What do you get, uh, your child gets out of, uh, out of uh, benefit of uh, playing sports? And recall, adults, three quarters of them said they played a sport when they were in, in school. So it helps their health uh, in terms of skills, discipline, how to get along with other people, uh, mental health, uh, functioning other people. It helps their careers. They really see it builds the type of characters and working with other people's skills that lead them to succeed. Uh, but uh, next PowerPoint. Uh, so uh, this is the adult we talked to. Three quarters said, not me. Uh, uh, for that, uh, one quarter does play a sport. And just quickly, uh, when people talk about uh, sports, uh, uh, often they just look at what is covered on television. Americans play 50 different sports that they say are incredibly important to them. And it goes from basketball and golf and, uh, uh, and uh, tennis and volleyball, but you also have fishing and bowling and everything else. So Americans are attached to the sport. Those who actually do it, do it mostly once a week. And they're actually very interested and tense about how well they perform. So the one in four are actually incredibly engaged in it. But the three or four switch from thinking this is the greatest experience for their kids to being a spectator. Uh, so what the poll just opens up the question is, is there some way to bridge a gap uh, between uh, this enthusiasm for the power of this for health and other reasons for children to carry on after age 26? On the uh, last slide, did we cover the age right there? So there is age 26, the magic moment when you decide that this is not, not for you. And what's the answer why I don't do it? So we go from it's good for your health to half our people say, I don't do it because I have some health problem. I'm not interested uh, or it's not convenient to me. Uh, so we've switched from all the advantages of kids and all the disadvantages for me. That's what we hope this would contribute to today's discussion. Right. Well, we'll be hearing a lot more about that. I just have a couple of housekeeping notes that I wanted to, to go over. Uh, the, this program in, will include a Q&A at the end from our online audience and our in-studio audience. Uh, and you can also email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And there's also a live chat discussion going on online right now at the forum site. Um, I want to turn now to Liz Matzkin and uh, uh, talk to you in your role as women's uh, as leader of the women's sports medicine program at Brigham Women's. Um, talk to us about the the health benefits of sports and exercise for women. So I mean, it's clear that we know there are numerous benefits to sports and exercise in both men and women. Um, whether it's cardiovascular or what I like to talk about is bone health. I mean, exercise is paramount to bone health. Um, when we look at our youth in order for them to maximize their bone density, um, you can only do that to about the age of 25. So exercise when you're younger is clearly important for that. And then after the age of 25, what we wanna do is maintain that. And if you're not seeing some stress in your bones, doing some form of exercise, you're not gonna maintain your bone health. And the rate of osteoporosis in women is two to four times that in men. I mean, it's clearly different. One in 50% of the women in this room are gonna end up with osteoporosis if they don't take care of themselves. When we look at this poll, I think it has some fascinating findings, and I think the gender gap is clearly interesting. Um, when I think about it, I think there are several reasons why we see that. In the older women where the gap is the largest, those women probably didn't have the same opportunities that our younger 
youth have nowadays. I mean, sports are numerous. Even when I was growing up, I mean, I was the only girl on the Little League baseball team. The opportunities weren't there. I have three daughters. They can play anything they want. There are so many opportunities. So I hope that in the next 20 years, that gender gap is going to become narrower because more women are going to be exposed to sports at a younger age. The second thing is I think women tend to put themselves at the bottom of the list. So when they hit that age of 26, they've graduated college, they've finished playing, whether high school or college sports that were very organized. Now all of a sudden they have to take on the responsibility of a job, um, ultimately a husband, and then potentially children. And so as more and more responsibility comes, they have less and less time for themselves and they're probably not putting it first, but they should. Um, you need to carve out the time. We know that it's very important. The third thing that I would put out there is um, injuries. Um, when we look at the number of injuries we're seeing in our youth that are participating in sports, about three and a half million youths are presenting to a physician, the emergency department, due to a sports-related injury per year. When we break that down, about 50% of those injuries in our middle school and high school athletes are an overuse injury. All right? An overuse injury is preventable. All right? So with the right training and the right kind of things, we should be able to prevent a lot of these injuries. And I bring it up because even though we're very good at getting people back to playing, those injuries can lead to problems down the road. For example, ACL tears, extremely common, eight times more common in our female athletes. Um, the good news is you tear your ACL, we can do surgery, we get you back out on the playing field, you can go on, do anything you want. But the bad news is 20 years later, we cannot prevent the arthritis you're gonna get. So as we start seeing younger and younger patients presenting with an ACL tear, 13 years old, I mean, in 20 years, they're gonna only be in their 30s and they're gonna have an arthritic knee. So there are some issues with that. Preventing overuse injuries um, really is awareness. We need to educate parents. We need to educate our coaches, um, you know, which really then brings up the idea of specialization, which is, kids that are participating in a single sport year round. And you know these parents that want their kid to be the next professional soccer player, hockey player, baseball player, that specialization they think is gonna get them there. And youth bodies are not meant to specialize at a young age. Um, and there are very good studies that look that you know these kids who are specializing, 70% of them are gonna drop out mostly because of an overuse injury. And if we look at our professional athletes, the majority of them are multi-sport athletes until their college level or beyond. So I think it's really important that one, we participate and find something we wanna do, and two, it doesn't have to be the same thing over and over again. Thanks, a lot of good points there. The, the statistic on three and a half million injuries a year is really startling, and obviously if many of those can be prevented, we should be doing more. Um, I just want uh, to go to another uh, point that the poll highlighted, and, and that's the, the use of sports to, to build life skills in children. And as part of this um, project that we're working on, NPR has done a series of stories, continues to uh, present new stories over the next couple of weeks uh, related to the poll. And we have a clip now uh, from reporter Patty Naiman. Uh, and she is looking at sports participation among children and talk to a family in Los Angeles. If we could have that clip. Good, okay. How's your best one with your hands? Batting practice. And 10-year-old Jake Herrera is serious and focused. My number is eight. I usually, I, I prefer seven. That was my mom's number when she used to play soccer. Jake's on the all-star team. His parents aren't strangers to sports either. His dad, Octavio Herrera, loved basketball and baseball. All my fun memories growing up were around sports. And so to me, it's, it was something important to give my kids. Octavio and his wife, Amy, live in Los Angeles. So when it comes to pro ball, they're Dodgers fans. And their kids, well, they say it wasn't whether the kids would play sports. It was which sport they'd play. Jake um, didn't have a choice about sports really being important to him since he was a little baby. He had a ball. I think we have a picture of him at three months old with a little Dodger jersey and a glove. So uh, he was gonna definitely be introduced to sports early, and he took to it right away. 
And for Jake's sister, eight-year-old Alyssa, her passion is gymnastics. It was obvious, say her parents. She was a natural early on, swinging on monkey bars since she was two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Alyssa competes, and she's part of an elite team at her gym. Today, she works out with coach T. Rose Anderson. Ready? I'm much better. Let's see two more good ones. Alyssa's practicing splits on the beam. Really good. Make sure your feet, honey, land one foot in front of the other. Good. Stay on the beam. Mom, Amy Rogler. When you do sports when you're a kid, you learn how to win and you learn how to lose. You learn what it's like to put in a lot of work and not have things, you know, turn out terrifically. And you learn what it feels like to put in a lot of work and then win. You know, I think... You can't teach those lessons. You have to experience them. And that's what the majority of parents in our poll say. Sports isn't just an important physical and social activity. It also builds skills that can make a difference later in life. And that was uh, correspondent Patty Naiman, who is one of our health correspondents in Los Angeles. Um, We have several more stories, as I said, coming up in the next two weeks. So tune in to Morning Edition. Um, I want to turn now to Caitlin. Uh, one of the two athletes that have joined us today, uh, two elite athletes. Uh, She's a member of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And and Caitlin, can you talk to us about the importance of sports and life skill building and also talk to us a little bit about the need for women as role models to keep them participating perhaps throughout life? Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Well, it's an honor to be here as part of this discussion because Being an athlete has played an immeasurable role in my own life. And while as an Olympian, I'm proud to have competed for my country at the highest level, I'm also aware that sports have provided me with the tools and skills necessary to succeed in life beyond the ice. And I think the clip we saw is a great example of why this is the case. Um, First off, I I have to say that I love that Jake prefers to wear his mom's soccer number. That made me smile. And... uh, It reminded me of how lucky I was that I grew up in a family like Jake's where my parents supported me 100% in my drive to be an athlete. And I know that that wasn't always easy for them. I was often the only girl on the team. Not everyone thought that girls should or even could play hockey. Um, But luckily for me, my parents were undeterred by that and they encouraged me to pursue my passion. I also benefited from the opportunity to play sports through my community and through my school. And I really believe that you first have to have the opportunity in order to reap the benefits. And I've been able to experience these benefits firsthand. So I've been an athlete my entire life. And at this point, from a health perspective, physical activity, fitness, health, and nutrition have become permanent lifestyle musts for me. I know I need them to be happy and to live a happy life. And equally, if not more important, I've come to recognize that the, the intangible qualities that you learn from sports that makes sports such an important tool for individual development and personal growth. Because as an athlete, I learned how to succeed individually. And as a member of a team, I learned important values of teamwork and sportsmanship, how to work hard and sacrifice to achieve my goals. I learned to self-evaluate. I learned to identify and maximize my individual strengths as well as tackle and overcome weaknesses. I learned to embrace my role, whether as a starter or as a supportive teammate on the sidelines. And I learned balance and time management. I was a student athlete from the time I hit kindergarten until my last year of law school. So it really forced me to learn to maximize my time and be efficient while maintaining performance. And I think it's probably the skill that I'm most grateful to have taken from sports. But all of those skills are really the bedrock of success, whether we're talking about you know, as a member of your local community, your family, your workplace, or even in broader society. Um, And I also experienced many opportunities that I might not have had had I not been an athlete. I got to learn from many different mentors and coaches. I got to take on leadership roles at a young age. I got to pursue my education and seek out other meaningful activities that have enhanced my life. And as far as with respect to girls and women in particular, I think all of these benefits are significant. But Speaking as a woman, I believe that I truly benefited from the physical, emotional, and social self-confidence that you get through playing sports. And personally, I've found that to be an incredible advantage as I've moved on to face other challenges in my life beyond sports. 
And we've already brought up a couple of obstacles to everyone receiving those benefits. But for me, they really are retention, as we've started to talk about, that burnout, that early sports specificity, injuries, also parental pressures, which we touched on from the sports and health report, showing that one in four believe their child will be a professional athlete. Um, and more specifically for girls and women, I think access and opportunity to play is really an obstacle that we need to take on and take charge of. So uh, to confront these challenges in my role on the President's Council, what we do is to try and work towards making the benefits of participating in sports available to all youth, regardless of who you are, where you come from, your ability level, or your socioeconomic status. And we seek to accomplish that through cultivating partnerships with organizations and initiatives who are already leading the charge in these issues. And one example is the Aspen Institute's Project Play, which recently released their Sport for All, Play for Life playbook, which offers eight awesome strategies to reimagine sports in America and create programs that foster the health, physical activity, personal development, and well-being of all youth while also keeping sports fun, which for me, fun, that's the key word. And I think it'll fuel much of our conversations later in the program about solutions to some of the challenges that we face to make sports accessible to all. Right. No, you're right. We will be exploring several of those things. I want to pick up, though, on something that uh, Caitlin just said about access and opportunity and turn to Ed Foster Simeon. Uh, the U.S. Soccer Foundation, of which you're the president, um, is really working to provide more access uh, for kids, especially in urban areas. And our poll highlighted uh, an income gap that people at lower income levels contrary to what some people may think, are actually playing sports at a much lower rate than people with more money, uh, higher incomes. So Ed, um, tell us, share your thoughts with us. Well, you know, I, I was really glad that the uh, poll highlighted the income gap and what it means in terms of access and opportunity to play sports. For all the benefits that we talk about with sports, you know, the health benefits, the social benefits, all those things, you know, means that children really just don't have access to it. They don't have an opportunity to play. Uh, at the U.S. Soccer Foundation, we've been committed to providing access and opportunities for children in low-income communities to play soccer in their neighborhood right where they live. Uh, we uh, provide a program called Soccer for Success, uh, which is provided free of charge to children in the after-school hours, uh, giving the opportunity to engage for 90 minutes, three days a week, uh, playing soccer in small-sided games and, and having coaches who are trained to make it a fun engagement but also to leverage the teaching opportunities for those children so that they can develop the life skills that all the teachable moments in sports provide to them. Uh, the coach can leverage those. We provide safe places to play. You know, it's really easy to say go out and play, but if there isn't a safe playing field in your neighborhood where you live, um, that's, that's, you know, not going to happen for you. So we build safe places to play in communities, leveraging small spaces that are available in urban communities so that children have an opportunity to play right where they live. One of the challenges right now with sport is that um, it's evolved into a pay-to-play model. Almost all uh, recreational opportunities for children to play sports have a fee attached to them. And if you're in a low-income household, um, th that may not be an option to provide that for your children. And we don't think that that should be a barrier for children to have access to play. The challenge is that places where children used to have that opportunity in school, through PE, through intramural programs, after school, those things no longer exist in many places, particularly in low-income schools and low-income communities. So I think it's really important to address that gap because when you look at what sports does for a community, we often, too many people think of it as just fun and games. But as was mentioned, there are uh, health outcomes that result from this, there are social outcomes, engagement in school, uh, children are stay out of trouble when they're engaged in sports, girls are less likely to become uh, pregnant as teenagers when they're involved in, in and active in a sport. There's so many benefits from being engaged in sports that we should leverage that and, and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, one of the things that we have found is that sports actually creates, can help create a culture of health. I'll give you an example. Um, in South Central Los Angeles, very tough neighborhood, we provide the Soccer for Success program there through a community partner. The coaches not only teach the children soccer, 
but they talked to them about what they're eating, nutrition, how to eat a healthy diet, to be a better athlete, to lead an active, healthy lifestyle. Well, guess what? The children go home and tell mom and dad, you know, coach says I should eat better. But they live in a community, what is called a food desert, where there aren't uh, whole food markets and green grocers. But the parents came to the program operator and said to them, can you get a farmer's market to come on Fridays so that we can get some of these things that the children are asking for? So engaging the children in sport and physical activity, they get information, they take it home to their parents, but on top of the nutrition information, now the moms are walking around the, the soccer field when the kids are practicing. They're asking for a Zumba class when the kids are practicing so that they can get the physical activity. So you can create a culture of health, number one, by providing opportunities for children to be active, and then providing a safe place for people to play, and not just children. A, a safe place to play is important, not just for children, but for all ages. People want to feel that where they come outside or wherever they're going to recreate, that it's a safe place for them to be. And if you create that environment, people will come out. But if you don't create it, if you just leave it to chance, um, if depending on the neighborhood you live in, just going out to play is not an option. It's just not an option because it's safer to be on the couch watching television. So it's really important, all these issues that are raised by the poll, particularly the income gap, is incredibly important. But moreover, the outcomes that come from sport that extend way beyond what happens on the playing field. Uh, we, we track everything from BMI to cardiovascular fitness of the children in our program. 89% of the children see positive outcomes as a re result of the BMI uh, and as a result of participating in Soccer for Success program. Similar numbers in terms of cardiovascular fitness as measured by the PACER test. These are real measurable outcomes. Soccer is not just fun and games. Sport is not just fun and games. It has health value, et cetera. And the leverage of a coach as a mentor in a child's life, um, coaches are among the most influential people that children encounter. They go to school because they have to. They come running and laughing to their coaches because they want to be there and they want to learn from them. And leveraging that engagement is an opportunity. It's more than just fun and games. Thanks for that. I want to turn now to um, Kobe Jones. Uh, many of you know him as a very famous soccer player. Uh, and he's now ambassador for the U.S. Soccer Foundation. If you would, Kobe, talk to us about your uh, role as an ambassador and also give us a perspective on the importance of sports in a healthy lifestyle. Uh, well, of course, and first off, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, as my role as a U.S. Soccer uh, Foundation ambassador, it's been something pretty special. Um, just to look at this quote here, that today's children are likely to be the first generation to live shorter, less healthy lives than their parents due to obesity and other related diseases. That affected me when I heard that for the first time quite some time ago, and that's what really sparked my interest in giving back and, and helping out children. And being part of the Soccer for Success program was important for me. I saw it firsthand in South Central how the children were affected by the fact that they could have a place to play, that they were out there physically participating, how they related to their coaches. As Ambassador Simeon said, you could see the smiles on their faces, and that's important, that they want to be there and how it affects everybody around the neighborhood. And that's what people have to realize. It's not about just what happens on the field. It affects the local community. It brings the local community together. And that's, I think, what we're getting at here a little bit is that this program, Soccer for Success, can affect everyone in the neighborhood and it spreads out and it's infectious and that's very important because that's the general idea of sport um for me sports has given me everything in my life it's given me confidence it's given me the ability to uh, be in situations like this and feel comfortable speaking you know to people uh it is something that has allowed me to see things that i never thought that i'd be able to do to imagine um to travel the world and to give back you know, at, at a much uh, higher level. Um, 
within the urban communities, when I go back, I see the direct effects. You know, this has been something that, you know, Ed had talked about a little bit. But when you talk about the U.S. Soccer Foundation, the fact that they've given over 100 million to different soccer organizations to not only for the programming, but also for places to play. That's so important because we see parents, you know, in, in urban communities, you know, both parents might work. You know, they, they need safe areas that they can depend upon for their kids to be comfortable with, to be able to play, to have easy access to. It's not so simple to be able to just leave your kids after school. Like when I was growing up, it was about everything was there at school. Now it's about, you know, okay, are they going to be safe? What's going to be available to them? These are, these are a lot of the issues today that kids have to deal with, especially when you're talking about urban communities. I was, you know, exposed to a variety of different sports at my school. But as we see PE programs being cut out, um, situations where kids have to get home because they have to make sure that they're home before a certain time because it's just not safe. These are all these are all a lot of issues that kids have to deal with today that we have to try to help with. Um, when we talk about the the specialization, I think that comes also a little bit from the PE programs being cut out, where you're not exposed as a child to a variety of sports. You get one sport, that's what you can play because that seems to be the one that you have time for, and that leads what we talked about a little bit to all the different injuries that come, that specialization, the specificity of one action over and over and over. I think if, you know, people that go to the gym and work out, if they, you know, said, okay, you're just going to, you know, do the bench press, you know, day after day after day, that's probably not the smartest thing. So we have to realize as well that for sports, doing those same actions can cause issues, you know, within children, you know, so, that has to be focused on how can we give the, the children opportunities to have a variety of different sports. And I think that's one of the things that Soccer for Success does as well is as far as they have the first step, yes, with soccer, but partnering up with the schools to give those safe environments to be exposed to soccer. Now, can they tap into that and to other things? I think so. That, that will be important for the future for the kids. Great. Thank you, Kobe. Um, we're going to turn now to the second part of our program, uh, which is a more freeform, open discussion of some of the issues we've raised. And I'd like to set the stage by showing you an animation we've created and are going to post on the NPR website on Monday. Um, it's by animator Ben Arthur, and it's narrated by NPR correspondent Allison Aubrey. We thought it would be fun to look at the relative uh, caloric expenditure of various sports that people identified as sports in the poll, and um, it's 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 cute. It's it's fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's roll it. Kids play a lot. Adults, not so much. Which makes us wonder. How sporty are the sports that we play? Are they doing us any good health-wise? Some sports demand a lot of cardiovascular fitness. Others need strength, stamina. But even just sitting, the average American woman is burning 79 calories an hour. Her heart is ticking away. Her lungs are expanding. Blood is being pumped throughout her body. All of this takes energy. She can amp that up by going fishing. Baiting a hook and casting a line are all small movements that incrementally increase the amount of energy burned. And yes, golf is a sport. Walk an 18-hole course and you've walked five miles. Take the cart and you're still burning calories by playing. Now, shall we dance? Whether it's ballet or the jitterbug, Dancing isn't just beautiful, it's weight-bearing exercise. Fighting gravity to stay upright means stronger bones and muscles. Biking, swimming, and other non-weight-bearing sports are easier on the joints, but they don't burn as many calories. Some team sports demand a lot. They take coordination and time. Other sports? You can do them whenever you feel like it. But when it comes right down to it, the most healthful sport is probably the one you love to play. 
And that, as I said, was um, Allison Aubrey uh, covers food and nutrition for us at NPR, and Ben Arthur. Um, I, I'd like to turn now to ask uh, the panelists, how can we make it an easy choice for people to stay involved uh, in what they love? And I wonder if Ed or Liz, you have ideas on this. Um, I would say that, so there's been a trend over time that um, sporting facilities have become destinations. Um, they're wonderful facilities, regionalization in, of parks and, and um, wonderful even soccer complexes, um, but they are some place that you have to go. You have to um, have transportation to get there. I think making sports the, um, the easy and affordable choice right in communities where um, people live is really a key component um, to solving the problem. Um, if every time I want to play any sport, um, I have to get in my car or get in public transportation and, and go somewhere, um, that puts a barrier between me and that activity and a reason for me not to do it. If it is easily accessible in the community where I live, right in my neighborhood, I can go across the street and there's a field where me and my kids can play or there's basketball courts, or there's a rec center, or some other facility tennis courts, whatever the sport may be, if it is accessible in the communities, that is one of the keys to people actually utilizing um, um, th that, that activity. And add to that, ensuring that it's a safe environment, that people feel comfortable being there. Um, and a lot of times the safety of an environment depends on there being at least some basic level of programming in place. That there, if, there's, if it's an idle space, anybody kind of utilizes that space, the good guys and the bad guys, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, but if there's a programmed activity there, then it becomes a community space where everybody then comes and uses this space and it becomes not just whatever's going on on the field, but it becomes the parents and the grandparents around the field, you know, watching the activity becomes a healthy, place in the community. So it's really about um, making it, you know, access accessible, making play and sports the easy and affordable choice for people. Liz, you have some thoughts? I do. So I mean, I think accessibility is clearly important, but what I think the most important thing is, is find something you want to do, something you love to do, and do it. Um, I tell patients all the time, I mean, if you can't run or you don't like playing baseball, I mean, Figure out what it is you like to do. Walk, swim, jog, yoga. I mean, th there are endless opportunities. And in this day and age, you can join teams at any age. There's youth sports that are more organized than we want them to be. But there's also you know, sports for those that have finished college. And there's master athletes out there that are doing tons of things. And you know, I think it's just finding something that really engages you and doing it. Um, Caitlin, can you, you talked a little bit about Project Play. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the Aspen Institute um, uh, Sport for All, Play for Life playbook really offers a whole slew of recommendations um, as ways to confront some of the issues that we've been talking about today. And one thing that on the President's Council we've really chosen to emphasize is the value of fun and the value of really breaking down sports to what they're originally intended to be. It's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to want to go to practice. You're supposed to enjoy hanging out with your teammates. You're supposed to like learning from your coaches. It's supposed to be an enjoyable experience when you play sports. And one of the things that the Aspen Institute really highlights is something called the American Development Model, which I was familiar with through USA Hockey. And what it really is, is an age appropriate, age specific sort of teaching and coaching philosophy that really emphasizes fun. So it combines sport, play, and education and health, but it does it in a different way. So you're not just putting kids in a drill, in a line, waiting to work on one specific skill. You're encouraging overall athleticism, which is actually something Dr. Matskin spoke about earlier, and I think is incredibly important. If you, and Kobe mentioned this too, if you're only working on a slap shot on the ice, or you're only working on one way of skating on the ice as a young child, you're not developing that overall athleticism that's going to let you have a healthy and happy career within hockey and even beyond and whatever you're going to do throughout the course of your life. So for example, kids will learn to skate at the U8 level 
by playing soccer or tag or learning those basic skills while challenging their overall athleticism. And another one of the benefits of this philosophy is that it makes room for late bloomers. Because sometimes I think when you specify so early in sports, it kind of weeds out some of the kids who may not hit their stride until a little bit later. And that really dissuades you. That's not a fun experience. And if the goal is to get a maximum number of people enjoying playing sports, not just as children, but over the course of a lifetime, you really want to make sure that you value and uplift those skills of those people who, who may not be the best on the ice at age eight. And that's something that I think is really important when we're looking at increasing retention for longevity and sports participation. Yeah, that was one of the surprising things in the poll, I think, was that um, among adults, uh, the drive to win uh, competitiveness was a really strong finding. Um, Bob, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so, so for uh, people who actually participate, uh, their performance is incredibly important, and over half of them really have a drive to, uh, to win. So once you get involved and stay there, it actually means something to you what your performance is. So the people who stick with it really do carry values that are very, very important. And the, the problem was, how do we keep others concerned with sticking with it? Right. But those that did really cared a lot about their performance. We, people saw the poll originally, they said, oh, these are people who do something once a year, and why are you bothering interviewing them? And the answer is the people in our poll who played sports do it almost every week, and they care a lot about it. And that's really important, is people who do stick with it, it means something in their life. But at the same time, I'd go back to, to uh, what Caitlin touched on, which is, uh, when I was discussing this with people in our office, for example, because we do that a lot, um, <laughs> um, people said, well, the reason I stopped playing sports was because uh, I, you know, I didn't make the team. I was the last one chosen. Uh, you know, it just turned me off, so I just, got, I just lost my interest in sports at a very early age. It's, it's how do you get to the point that Caitlin's talking about that, that you know, you, ke you keep fun in the game and you get the people who are the, the slow bloomers. How do you get them and keep them involved at an early age and into an adulthood? Can I uh, jump in on that particular point? My friend Tom Ferry at uh, Aspen Institute's Project Play, he talks about squaring the pyramid. Um, there's always been an uh, elite pyramid in sport. It's a sorting out process. You know, who's good, who's the best, and it gets narrow as you go up. And what that typically leads to is the best athletes get to continue playing, but then there are very few options for those who don't make that cut. And he talks about building a square around that pyramid which has, which has other opportunities for people to continue playing whatever sport it is or activity that there is outside that, and they may go back into the pyramid as they develop their their skills or as they mature as athletes, they may find their way back into the pyramid, but that they can continue to have opportunities to play. Now, uh, in many ways, it seems to be um, either you're in or you're out, basically. Either you're in the pyramid or you're out. And we need to change the mind, and that's really a mindset thing. That's really about um, how we perceive sport. At, we, do we value the play for play's sake? as opposed to the only value being associated um, to being in the pyramid and making your way to the top. And that, of course, leads to what Liz was saying about we have uh, people who are over-specialized and getting overuse injuries, and that ultimately keeps them out of sports as they get older. Do you want to talk not only, more about yeah, that? that doesn't only, not only does that keep them out, but when these young kids are feeling the pressure, whether it's from coaches or parents or, or even themselves, of trying to stay in that pyramid and make it to that, the number of those kids that drop out of sports is astounding. It's, it's clearly over 50%. And so I think that's the big thing is, you know, play whatever. I mean, I have three daughters. They love sports and they play three sports. And it's really hard um, as a parent to tell coaches from one sport to the other that, like, look, you know, they're still in soccer season now, so they're not going to be at the, you know, those early September hockey practices or when hockey's lingering on into lacrosse season, makes it really hard for kids nowadays, I mean, I'm talking eight years old, to play more than one sport. But I think that's where we really need to kind of change things. These kids need to be encouraged to get out there and play, play lots of things. And as they age and their bodies grow and mature and they're, 
through growing and they've gone through puberty, those are when they can start kind of honing in and trying to figure out where they want to go with it. But their young bodies are not meant for, you know, over and over. And baseball is a big one. We've actually implemented pitch counts in Little League because we're seeing way too many shoulder and elbow injuries in these young kids. And guess what? You know what? You injure it at that young age, you're never going to have a chance of playing on into college. So it's really important that we try and get control of that. I mean, get them out there, get them to play, but it, it's hard. It's a hard, fine line to walk of where you draw the line of, you know, what's too much and what's not enough. I want to turn now to Lisa Merowitz, who has questions from online, and we'll take some from the audience in a moment. Go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Lisa. We have a lot of questions. We can only have time for a few. So I encourage everyone to go online. Um, I'll just share a few here. Are the numbers of adults who participate in sports differ meaningfully from the number of adults that participate in exercise programs? If so, what might help to explain such a difference? Bob? Uh, so, uh, half the adults in our survey said they I were involved in active exercise uh, programs, but only a quarter of the adults uh, in, in a sport. So the first answer is uh, the majority of our adults who are engaging in exercise, that are various cardio uh, uh, exercises and everything, but if you put the two together overwhelmingly, you walked or ran. Uh, so you didn't have to sign up for a team, uh, etc. You could do it around the neighborhood, around the house. So uh, exercise is much more convenient, which raises a lot of our other discussions. If you want them in a sport, convenience is important. Uh, so it, it shows about a half, the last half full or half empty. We first looked at it and said, well, look, so many more people at least exercise and play a sport. And then everybody in the health world said, my God, half of America isn't doing either. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but something has to happen if we want that other half to go. But it's easier for people to do an exercise within their normal life uh, living. And they had a debate with NPR with whether or not chasing the bus was an organized form of exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa. An issue raised concerning funding of, of sports is that many municipalities put forward a considerable amount of tax money to support semi or professional sports teams. How might such funding patterns af affect sporting opportunities for adults within that community? Oh, let's see, who wants to go with that one? I think uh, every city, every municipality, every government has to make choices about where they invest their dollars. Uh, and a growing number of communities are, the quality of life in the community is incredibly important now to attract employers to your community, to your city. You want to have an environment that people uh, feel is a rich quality of life. So when there's opportunities to uh, be physically active, there's bike trails, there's you know sporting opportunities, and all those kinds of things are are part of building what is called a healthy community that people want to live in and want to be a part of. So I think that the decision makers have to strike the right balance of, of investing enough at the community level to ensure that there is a rich quality of uh, recreational and sport life available for individual citizens right in their neighborhoods and right where they live to participate. Thank you. I'll do one more because we really do have a lot of questions and we are getting a number around built environments and this sort of thing. Um, this is from Rebecca Ramsey. There is growing interest in the field of urban planning on making connections between the built and natural environments and health. I'm interested in understanding if different populations have differing access physical and financial to recreation spaces, and if there have been patterns noticed in terms of financial access by geography, disability, race, age, et cetera. So I, I know we got into some of this, but I don't know if there's anything else to elaborate on there. Well, th there, are, there are disparities in terms of what facilities are available. Uh, where your zip code make, makes, it, makes a big difference in what uh, you have access to in your community. Uh, in fact, your zip code, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has reported out, will do, is a determinant of, of how long you will actually live uh, b based on your health. And your health is determined by a lot of factors, including the opportunity to be physically active and physically fit and to, to have access to recreational opportunities. So I would say that there is clear evidence that 
Um, living in a lower income community limits your access to quality facilities, the number of facilities, you know, uh, the safety of those facilities. All those things are very important issues and that's one of the reasons why at our foundation, the U.S. Soccer Foundation, we've made a specific emphasis on addressing needs in underserved communities where there just aren't the resources at the family level to close that gap. Um, in the neighborhood where I live, um, the community members pay extra so that there are things at their schools. They pay extra so that there are things at their parks. Um, if you live in a community where folks don't have that kind of disposable income, you know, what do you do to address that? And so you have to invest in putting the play spaces in those communities. You have to invest in putting programming in those communities that's either free or very low cost for children to be and families to be able to access. Thank other you. thoughts from other panelists? All right, let's move on to the, do you wanna ask one more question? Uh, well, I'll take a short one because people are asking about various forms of exercise. This is for Kobe or Liz. Um, is CrossFit dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Kobe can take that one. <laughs> I can tell you CrossFit keeps me in business. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let, let me go with, look, any sport is dangerous if you're not trained in it properly. You know, that, that's all there is to it. CrossFit, yeah, yeah, look, I wouldn't try it. You know? It's a little out, outside my realm. Um, but look, as long as it gets people out there and, and active, I'm good with that. Yeah, it, it probably does keep, like you said, a lot of doctors in business as people just try to rush into it. But yeah, take your time. You know that that's what it's all about. Learn about what you're getting yourself into before you jump into jump into the deep end. That that's what it's all about. It's about safety first and foremost, and then making sure that that health benefits come through after you're you know continuing to play. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Do we want to take one from the audience? Um, does anyone here have a question that they'd like to ask? Yes. Um, Relating to the infrastructure um, questions, does the data, Bob, um, indicate at all ge in terms of geographic locations? There are certain cities in America that are have become, they're ahead of the curve on uh, built infrastructure. Uh, Seattle, Portland, D.C. to some extent. Um, Boston is uh, one of the nation's leading walkable cities by some statistics. Do you have sort of geographic idea of whether adults as well as kids are exercising, playing sports more in those such cities? And um, as a follow-up to that, the, the, the data on the adults, um, do the kids of adults who do exercise, do they, are they dramatically more active than the kids of parents who don't exercise? Good questions. Uh, uh, so the first, uh, the national poll can't uh, yield uh, city data. What's very important on your point is, if we're going to go in the next stages of this, cities who really invest, we need some measure of how people's lives have really changed. So we don't have it, but it'll be very, very important because if I invest something in Boston, I make this huge effort, I have to be able to say to people in other cities, I've done this. And we don't have that. We have all these health measures, but they're not tied to, uh, 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 to people's participation. So uh, the a answer is if you, uh, uh, play a sport as a child, you're more likely to play a sport as an adult, but what's staggering is the number who did and don't. Uh, so uh, if we just narrowly look probability, yes, if you're playing a sport now, you would have done it. But if you look at the other side of the table is, hey, um, most people who played one when they're younger are not playing now. So the fall off is just quite dramatic. The, the things are, are not there. And looking at the fact that half our adults don't do any exercise at all, it doesn't sweep in, well, okay, they walked uh, out of sports, but they're really doing these other things. A lot of them just quit. Uh, and that really is going to be the challenge of the future, I think. I'll take one last question and then I know we have to wrap up. Is there any way that insurance companies can promote group sport participation in the way that some policies try to promote gym memberships? 
Hmm. Oh, that was an interesting, <laughs> interesting idea. That's a, that's a very interesting idea. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk at a lot of levels about the return on investment of, you know, creating healthier young people, healthier adults, healthier families. Um, but that's still a hard nut to crack um, uh, when you talk about making investments today for payoffs, you know, significantly down the road. And so I, I think it's a very good question. Uh, you would think that anything that would reduce health care costs over time would be a good investment um, of dollars. Um, but I'm not sure that we're quite there yet. One thing about that really quickly is that it's not up to someone else to keep you healthy. It's up to you. And I have that discussion with patients all the time. I mean, patients come in, their knee hurts, I can't exercise, and they're overweight. And I say, well, you know, you've got to, one, find something you can do, take the weight down, because that's going to make your knee feel better, and then you've got to stick with it. But it's not up to me to give you a shot or a magic pill. I mean, so patients or people just really need to, they want to want to take care of themselves. And I think that's the bottom line. It's not really up to, you know, even the programs you're creating. I mean, these people need to want to come. I mean, we can put the fields there, we can give them great coaches, but they have to want to be there. Uh, can I just add on that, though? I would say that in the communities that we work in, the demand is there. When the opportunity is presented, um, parents are pushing their children to these programs because they want them to be physically active. They want them to run around and laugh and have fun. They want all those things for their, for their children, just as we want them for our children. It's that the access and the opportunity is not there often enough. And when it's presented, parents push their children out there. When it's presented, parents come out and walk around the field because they're getting something out of the experience. They know that it's good for them as well. Do Thank we have you. time for one more? I have a question. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we uh, found in the poll that was, was striking was that one in four, and it's been mentioned a couple of times here, I think, but um, I'd like to explore it a little bit with Kobe and Caitlin. Um, one in four parents think their child will become a professional athlete. That's obviously statistically the police would like them to be. <laughs> impossible. But I just wonder what your reaction was to hearing that rather astonishingly high number. Toby, you want to take it since you're on the screen? Sure. I, I think it's it's rather surprising. I think it's it's not realistic to be very honest with you. Uh, one in four, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. Not everyone can play at a professional level, but I think one of the things that ties in when we talk about the specialization that takes away from it, and I think it was mentioned earlier, is that when you do specialize in one sport, you are limiting yourself to the possibility of being great in something that you didn't play. If you're just playing soccer, for instance, you don't get that opportunity to maybe learn and love baseball and realize that you're better in baseball and have that possibility to be professional, or at the very least, which I'm sure a lot of parents are, you know, concerned about getting a, a, a college scholarship. You know, these are things where if you keep it open, you keep it wide at the beginning, play a variety of different sports, you get to learn. And I think that touches on a little bit of, look, we all know sports is important. The issue is, is getting kids to play a variety of different sports and love it. And I think w we all know where the kids are all the time and that's at school and that lack of uh, opportunities at school as far as PE being cut out I think is a lot of the problem I think it has to start at an early age of letting them be exposed to all these different sports for a long period of time in their youth so they can realize what they're good at what they love and then to continue to grow from there and let them decide later on you know later on when you hit those teens or late teens, which one you really want to specify and, and become better at and possibly push to be that professional athlete. And I can speak personally because I didn't expect to play soccer, you know, past high school. I was just going to play and, and, and be done in college. And, but I, did, I was a late bloomer. I bloomed in college where I was a walk-on at UCLA. So that's where I started hitting my stride. So I'm the perfect example of play everything and then you'll find out because a lot of people do get left by the wayside because they don't have that opportunity to really know what they're good at. 
Thanks. I think we do have to wrap it up now. That was a great comment. I want to thank our distinguished panel here today. Uh, I want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting this and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health for all the hard work you do in the polling and putting, putting on these broadcasts. Um, the conversation is going on at the forum right now. It continues. I would encourage those of you online uh, who have questions and want to discuss some of these issues to go there. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>